General McCaffrey, uh, Andrea touched on so many things, and I, and I want to kind of bring them together if I can. Uh, she talked about the interview with Cindy McCain, which was very blunt about the catastrophic situation on the ground. Uh, many aid workers who have been on the ground have suggested in recent days and certainly in recent weeks that we're looking at a full-fledged famine. Very influential columnist in The New York Times, Nick Kristoff, dedicated part of his column this weekend to a photograph of a child in a hospital bed with his mother holding him who reportedly had starved to death. And then you have the pressure that continues from the hostage families who have been living all this time, General, as you know, without the knowledge of what condition their family members are in or even if they're alive. When you balance all of that against what Andrea just said, the pressure from ultra conservative members of his cabinet, as well as the own, his own political peril for a Benjamin Netanyahu, where does that leave us? Well, who knows? Um, you know, at the end of the day, Israel is in a treacherous, perilous situation. Uh, the shorthand for a pause in the fighting versus a permanent ceasefire is the Israelis acknowledging, which, which I think will be the outcome, that Hamas is going to return to governance of Gaza, something widely opposed among the Israeli population, because it says there'll be another 7 October at some time in the future. In addition, we should understand the Israelis have massive humanitarian losses themselves, 80,000 some odd people up in the north, uh, confronted by constant fire from Hezbollah, are now evacuated from that part of Israel. And all along the, uh, the border with Gaza, uh, those communities have not returned. And then finally, uh, the real key to getting the hostages all back was to put at peril uh, the senior leadership of Hamas, which, as people widely understand, is either out of the country or underground in tunnels in the Rafah area. And I think uh, Netanyahu's intent was uh, to place their lives at peril and try and get back all the hostages. If they get back 33, They'll never get back the remainder, however many may well, well still be alive. So I think the Israelis have lost the information war. Uh, they have destroyed a good bit of Gaza. Probably 70-some-odd percent of the, uh, the structures have been damaged or destroyed. They have killed a lot of civilians. Uh, there were 30,000 Hamas fighters, we said. They probably killed eight to 12,000 of them. Uh, but Hamas is likely to emerge from all this uh, in control of a destroyed Gaza that they deliberately brought upon themselves. They understood that the Israelis could not tolerate 7 October and would have to go back into a densely packed urban area with 2.4 million civilians living in it with the catastrophic results that we've seen. So. Israel is not in a very good situation, in my view, at this point. So, Admiral Stavridis, I want to go back to something you and I talked about in the early days of this, following October 7th, when I think at least 1,200 Israelis and other foreigners were killed in the worst attack on Israel since its founding in 1948, and that is the pledge by Benjamin Netanyahu that he wanted to make sure there would never be another October 7th. And as the general just rightly pointed out, for so many Israelis, that is the ultimate goal here. And yet, to go back to that, those early conversations, is that possible, at least in terms of getting rid of Hamas, making sure Hamas is dismantled forever? I don't think it's ever possible to completely dismantle terrorist organizations. And we've seen that again and again and again as we've gone after Al Qaeda and Boko Haram and uh, more recently Islamic State. What, what you can do is take away their means of attack. You can degrade them and reduce it. And I think the operations here are designed to do so. As I mentioned a moment ago, Chris, uh, decommissioning this complex web of 400 miles of tunnels underneath Gaza, which is only 25 miles by five miles, 400 miles of tunnels. That's got to be job one here. Job two alongside it 
is to continue to uh, execute uh, a plan that permits taking care of the civilians. But even as you are conducting the war fighting that General McCaffrey spoke about just a moment ago, that is going to continue once the ceasefire is over. And Raf correctly pointed out we don't know what is in this agreement yet that Israel might disagree with. Uh, he pointed to the idea that Israel would want only a pause. Hamas would want a path at least to a complete ceasefire. The other thing we don't know is governance. Will Israel keep forces inside Gaza? That's been a significant sticking point. I think over time, you're going to see the Israelis want some presence in Gaza, but they will probably uh, go after some combination of Arab League peacekeepers, maybe some UN peacekeepers, maybe sprinkle some Palestinian authority over that. They'll want to continue to be deeply involved. All of that is in the to-be-determined category. Uh, final thought, back where we started a moment ago, it's these civilians who are desperately in need who will most benefit from even a temporary ceasefire. For that reason, we all ought to be uh, hoping and cheering if we get even a 40-day pause in the fighting. It's important. We have gotten a statement from Liz Naftali, who is the aunt of Abigail Eden, now four years old. She was held hostage and released. You may remember that she met with President Biden, and there's a picture of him holding her. Um, but in spite of the fact that Hamas has accepted the ceasefire proposal, or at least the head of the political wing has, we are still waiting to hear from Israel.